efficient computation of sparse matrix functions for large-scale electronic structure calculation as implemented in, in the CHESS library. Okay, thank you very much for giving me the possibility to present our work. So I will talk about the chess library that we developed uh, during the past months and years at BSC in collaboration with uh, various people also from uh, abroad, from, in particular from France and from Japan. So the outline of the talk, uh, first I will talk a little bit about the motivation and the applicability of uh, chess in electronic structure codes. Uh, then I will um, briefly talk about the theory behind chess, uh, a few words about sparsity and truncation, and then several uh, performance figures, so accuracy, scaling, parallel scaling, and finally also um, comparison with other methods. Well, as you uh, all know, uh, linear algebra is a very important uh, topic in electronic structure code. Sooner or later, all codes will have to deal with this. And you can do it in standard way, for instance, with LAPAC, ScalarPAC, these are standard libraries. But they can become a bottleneck because in the worst case they scale uh, cubically. And so your code will uh, hit the wall. And it's even worse if you have sparse matrices because in this way if you have sparse matrices and use these standard tools then you will just uh, multiply a lot of zeros and you will waste a lot of compute time. And sparse matrices are actually quite uh, abundant. You, can, you will find them if you have a specific basis set that um, incorporates um, localization, or also if you have intrinsic localization properties of your matrices. And to do, deal with this, we created a standalone library for sparse linear algebra, in particular tailored for electronic structure codes. And we called it CHESS, which stands for Chebyshev Sparse Solvers. Um, I will show you later how it works. Just uh, to start, um, I can already tell you that CHESS works very well if your matrices exhibit a very small spectral width. So it's really tailored for, for this purpose. And now the question is, do we encounter such situations in uh, electronic structure codes? And if, of course, it depends on the basis that you use, that indeed it's possible. I show you here uh, a few systems. All of them are very large and very sparse. They are calculated with a localized basis as implemented in the big TFT code, which is the code that uh, was first coupled with chess. And I show you here the, um, for the overlap matrix the condition number, and you see the basis is, is really um, very nice and leads to condition number that are only of the order of two. And also, if you look at the spectral width of the Hamiltonians, these are electron volts. You can see that we are of the order of 30 to 40, maybe 50 electron volts. And if you are in such a setup, chess uh, performs extremely well, as I will show you later. So the, the basic idea of chess is not new. Um, well, it was developed, uh, the basic idea, about 20 years ago. So the the idea is to develop our matrix function in terms of uh, Chebyshev polynomials like this. Um, well, this is the matrix that you want to develop. You have to scale and shift it since these uh, polynomials are already defined from minus 1 to plus 1. And the expansion coefficients, it looks complicated, but it's not. It's a standard textbook uh, formula. The most important point, and also the, the heaviest, is the calculation of the Chebyshev uh, polynomial matrices down here. But they have a very nice recursion relation. So uh, you have just to iteratively apply a matrix to another matrix, or actually a matrix to a vector. Because it turns out, if you look at this formula, that each column of your matrix is independent. 
So this is an algorithm that you can uh, parallelize very well because you just put several columns to, to one processor and then each processor does its work uh, independently. As I told you, Chess at the moment is tailored for electronic structure code, so we implemented the functions that you need to perform density functional theory. In particular, this is a calculation of the density matrix, so the function that you, oh sorry, sorry. The function that you want to expand is just a Fermi function. You can also calculate the energy density matrix, which is very similar, or matrix powers. This is the most general that we have, so the power here, the A, can be anything, also non-integer value, so you can also calculate square roots, inverse square roots, etc. But it's very easy to generalize this, so we could also include more functions. The only thing that we have to change to implement here is the calculation of these uh, coefficients, which is very easy to do. So I told you chess works with sparse matrices, and if you have sparse matrices, uh, you have to choose uh, well, a sparsity pattern. And we decided to work with a fixed sparsity pattern, math pattern that is uh, user-defined. So a user in the beginning has to define what is your sparsity pattern, and then chess does the calculation within this pattern. So we have in chess uh, three patterns. So first of all is the pattern of the original matrix M. That's usually defined by your, your setup, by your basis function. Then we have the sparsity pattern for the matrix function, which is usually a bit larger so that the function can has a space to expand. And then is a third auxiliary pattern for the multiplication, that's the technical detail. And here I show you how it looks like in a typical setup. So you have here a very sparse matrix. You can see in gray, this is the, the entries that are set to zero. And here on the right-hand side, this is the inverse of this matrix, calculated with any constraint, just with a, a dense calculation. And you can see the matrix spreads out a little bit, but still there is a lot of white space, meaning uh, that here there are a lot of zeros. So it's justified to do this calculation here, also within a sparse pattern. And indeed, that is what we did here. So this is the calculation with chess, where in gray we again define our uh, enlarged sparsity pattern. And you, as you can see, we really capture very well the, the entries that are non-zero. And this is the difference between this and this one on a, well, a different scale. You can see the typical error is of the order of 10 to the minus 10. So really, really small. Well, uh, now we are, let's talk a bit about accuracy. And as you can imagine, there are two factors that affect the accuracy. So first, it's the error that you introduce by the sparsity pattern. And secondly, it's the error that you introduce by the Chebyshev fit. And this also, it's, it's not really clear what is actually the correct solution. Um, the most straightforward way would be to define the correct solution as the one that you obtain if you do a calculation with, for instance, LAPAC without any um, um, constraints, any sparsity constraints, and then you just truncate. But then the problem is that this solution usually does not fulfill this identity. So if you calculate the matrix function and then apply the inverse, you should again get back the original function. But with this approach, this is not true. So we think that the better way is to define the correct solution as the one that you directly calculate within the sparsity pattern. And then, uh, well, you ask for the fulfillment of this uh, identity here. This is how we define our correct solution. Basically, because in this way, we can uh, get rid of the, the bias that you introduced by the sparsity pattern. And one more slide about sparsity. So, as I told you, we work with a fixed sparsity pattern, but an alternative would be to use uh, a dynamic approach so that during the calculation you set to zero all elements that are below a given threshold. The advantage of this is, well, that it's very flexible and you can ca control the error that you have. But on the other hand, the sparsity of your matrix can decrease a lot and then your calculation cost can explode. And this is a, a test that we did with a purification method, which uh, has such a dynamic sparsity control. And you can see we start here with a sparsity of more than 98%, but then we have a very strong fill-in. And at iteration 10, 11, we are already have a sparsity of only 93%. So you can imagine that the cost here is much, much higher than here. And this is very hard to, to know beforehand. That's why we think it's uh, better to work with a strict, with a predefined sparsity pattern 
and in this way we already know in the beginning what will be the cost and, uh, of, of your calculation. <coughs> So now about the accuracy, um, I show you here two benchmarks, first for the inverse, and here are two errors. As said before, this is the error down here which is related to the Chebyshev fit, and you can see that it's negligible of the order of 10 to the minus 11. So the Chebyshev fit is really, really accurate. And up here you see the error that is introduced due to the sparsity pattern. It's a bit larger, but still of the order of 10 to the minus 7, which in practice uh, doesn't matter at all. Looking at the density matrix, uh, here I calculate that, so the energy, the trace of the kernel density matrix times the Hamiltonian matrix. And we can see that the, the relative error is of the order of 0.01%, <coughs> which in practice uh, also is very, very small and negligible. Now, um, thanks to the fact that we can exploit sparsity, our chess library um, scales linearly with respect to the number of non-zero elements. This is uh, shown in this plot here. So I show you the runtime to invert the matrix. So we have various matrices from 6,000 times 6,000 up to 36,000 square. But as you can see, the runtime does not depend on the total matrix size, but only on the number of non-zero elements. So the whether you have a, lot, a small matrix or a big matrix, the only important thing, number that actually matters is the number of uh, non-zero elements. And this shows that the library exploits sparsity really well. I've already told you that it's very sensitive to the spectral width, and this is shown here. This is um, the, the runtime and the poly polynomial degree that we need to invert the matrix for various condition numbers. So on the left-hand side, we see we start with a condition number of about a 2, which leads to a polynomial degree of the order of 50 and a runtime of a few seconds. But then if we increase the condition number, and we go here on the right-hand side, where we have a few thousand, you can see that it explodes. So with the polynomial degree that we need to well approximate, the, the function is already of the order of 2, 3,000, and the runtime already uh, the order of 10 minutes. So you can see if we, if we are able to work in this regime, it's really, really an efficient algorithm. If we work here, then we should do, better use another approach. This is also here visible for the calculation of the density matrix. Again, we can see that for uh, the larger the spectral width, the more expensive it's a calculation. So we can see here for a spectral width of 150 electron volts, we need more than 2,000 polynomials. Whereas if you have a spectral list of 50 EV, we can bring it down to the order of a few hundreds. Uh, for the density matrix, another important point is the, the gap, the homolumo gap. If you imagine if you have a small, um, well, a gapless system, then the Fermi function is more or less a step-like function, which is very hard to approximate with a polynomial. And also the cost becomes very high. So uh, the bottom line is this library is very good for uh, systems with a gap, large bank gap, and with a small spectral width. Um, finally, before comparing with other methods, uh, one word about parallelization. As I've told you, the algorithm of chess, well, it's really um, can be parallelized in a very efficient way, and we also did a lot of effort in this direction to reach a really a, very, a good scaling. This is again the calculation of the inverse. Um, you can see here the number of cores, and this is speed up. And you can see even the matrices are not very big, but even for more than 2,000 cores, we are very, very close to the perfect scaling. And on the right-hand side, these are the run times. You can see if we use many cores, we can invert the matrix of the order of uh, 30,000 square within only a few seconds, which is not so bad. We also went further, we want to, wanted to really know what's extreme scaling, so we went up to 16,000 cores. And you, of course here now it becomes a bit uh, flat. But still, if the matrix that we looked at, 96,000 squared, is not really huge. So using 16,000 cores to invert this matrix and still um, getting the speed up is not bad. And you please notice that this speed up is relative with uh, respect to the first point, which already uses 1,500 cores. So overall, we get here a speed up of the order of five, six, seven thousand, which is uh, quite good. 
Now to conclude, we um, compare chess to, to other methods. So um, we, first of all, we compare it to selected inversion, which is another method um, that can calculate the inverse and exploit sparsity. And then we also compared it with two dense standard approaches, namely scalar pack and layer pack. We have here five uh, different matrices, so from 6,000 square to 30,000 square. <coughs> and we did this pro um, benchmark for various condition numbers here from 2 to about 150. So first let's look at the dense uh, solutions. These are the yellow and the blue uh, lines here. So first of all, they are constant, so there is no dependence on the spectral width. And as you would expect, their cost explodes because they are scaling uh, well cubically. If we look at selected inversion, also selected inversion shows no dependence on spectral width and you can gain a lot compared to these dense approaches. But you can see here the, the purple curve is a chess library and indeed if you are working with small spectral width, it is the fastest method. Compared with selected inversion, the crossover with respect to the condition number is at about 150. So if you have a matrix with a condition number below this value, well, you can use chess to save some time. Otherwise, I think it's better to go to selected inversion. Finally, we also compare the calculation of the density matrix here. Um, so first of all, we don't compare with LAPAC and scalar pack because it's obviously worse. Uh, but we compare it with PECC, that's a library that was uh, developed uh, here by Lin Lin, and that can also use uh, exploit the sparsity. Um, we compared uh, two different uh, setups. Let's first look at the MPI only version. We did this because PEXI uh, is very efficient with MPI parallelization. So these are the blue and the yellow curve. And you can see here for these small matrices, PEXI here is um, the fastest in this setup. Later on, there's a switch, so chess becomes more efficient because chess really scales linearly, whereas PEXI, in this case, because it's a three-dimensional system, has a quadratic scaling. On the other hand, if you use a hybrid scheme, so MPI and OpenMP parallelization, we can see that uh, in all cases, uh, chess is the most efficient um, method, but this is not the problem of, of PEXI because it's a bad algorithm, just because PEXI is not very well parallelized with OpenMP. That's why we, we gain here. But you can see here that really with chess, you can calculate uh, the density matrix, the uh, density kernel uh, within a few seconds, for, even for very big systems. Last slide. Um, now I've presented to um, chess, which the library to calculate uh, sparse matrix algebra. But it's not the only one. There are also other libraries. I've talked about PEXI, but there is also ELPA, LibOMM, etc. And sometimes it might be cumbersome for a code developer to interface with all of these codes. Imagine every time that somebody changes, you have to change again your interface, etc. And therefore, some people in the US uh, started this LC project, and their idea is to unify all of these libraries. This means that if you have an electronic structure code, you only have to interface with LC, and then internally LC interfaces with all of these various tolerers. So in this way, for a code developer, for, for maintenance, it's much easier to, to uh, stay, to keep up to date with all the developments that are going on down here. And so at the moment, Chess is not yet in LC, but we are um, working with them and we're hoping that in the future, Chess will also be included in LC. So if your code already interfaces LC, you will get Chess for free without uh, any work. Uh, let me conclude. So I present you Chess, which is a flexible tool for the calculation of matrix functions, tailored specifically for density functional theory. But it can also be extended to, to other uh, to other functionalities for the purposes. Uh, it can exploit the sparsities of the matrices and in this way reach a linear scaling with respect to the system size. It works very well for a small spe uh, spectral width of the matrices, so it was specifically tailored for this purpose. And last but not least, it uh, exhibits a very good parallel scaling. We have a hybrid scheme which works with both MPI and OpenMP. That's all, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Steph.